Okay, in terms of the stuff, as always, just bad news. Some good news. But not good. Uh, deadline said it's been a long quiz in the uh, quiz in part one. Deadline September 18th, that's to say today, at the end of the day, 11th uh, to 9 p.m. So be sure to wrap those up by today if you haven't done so already. Exam one, quizzes part two, cover October uh, 16, again, end of day. Exam two, quizzes part three, cover, uh, end on November 13th. Exam three, exam four, quizzes part four, deadline by December 4th, also end of day. And then exam number five, the deciding final, deadline is December 11th at noon. For the paper, if you want to do a draft, be sure to get that to me by November 16th. If you want the plus five bonus, be sure to turn it in by November 18th through Blackboard. If you want full credit, be sure it's in by November 25th on Blackboard. If you want half, be sure it's in by December 4th, also on Blackboard. Before pressing on to the new stuff, anything about the stuff to be or the stuff that has been that needs more stuff. Okay, so now we just did two last methods to wrap up. And we'll conclude those today, and then on Monday, we'll begin our exciting adventures in part two, moral theory. Dun, dun, dun. Now last time we're looking at appeal to consequences, which is a very useful kind of go-to method, as I mentioned before, if you're, you know, working the paper, you're like, ah, crap, I don't know how to argue. Uh, appeal to consequences is probably one of the easiest ways to do it. Weigh the pros, weigh the cons, you know, weigh them together, Put in the bit about how this is how you do morality, draw the appropriate conclusion, respond back with like a different weighing or a different evaluation, or the counter method, reply back to that, paper done. Now we saw last time the appeal to rules as well. The idea being that it's the view, sort of opposed to consequentialism, that morality is based on rules. And that method is also pretty straightforward to use. You just need to get a rule, put it in place, apply it to the thing, and argument done. Now, another method in our series, in the last of the, the methods except for mixing norms, is appeal to rights. And the idea is this. In the West, a standard part of you know, both political and ethical philosophy is a notion of rights. And when we get to part two and part three, we'll take a look at our good dead friend John Locke talking about natural rights. And everyone's heard of these, you know, right to life, liberty, and property, which of course was changed to pursuit of happiness in the, in the United States. Now, in many cases, many of the debates we have, legally, politically, and more for our purposes, morally, involve conflicts of rights. For example, we talk about, say, to take a, a case torn from today's headlines, you can look at the case involving uh, Kim Davis, the county clerk in Kentucky, claiming a right to religious freedom, and people who want to get married to her same-sex couples, claiming the right to marriage. And you might see that as a conflict of rights, perhaps to be resolved by an appeal to rights. So one way to argue morally is in this manner, to appeal to rights. Uh, for example, a person may argue, bless you, argue against you know, government intrusion, by appeal to the right to privacy. A person may argue against abortion by an appeal to the right to life. A person might argue for you know, suicide based on an appeal to the right to die. And so appeals to rights are a common way to argue. So how do you build one of these? Well, conveniently, it follows kind of a similar three-part pattern that we saw with the other ones, which is kind of handy. So, like um, appeal to consequences, appeal to. I have a question. Yes. The, um, the quiz part one, today mm -hmm. at what time? Uh, end of day, 11.59, 59 p.m. But it's actually five quizzes. Okay. So there's the syllabus quiz, and then the four, each of the quizzes corresponds to basically a week of material. Okay. Yep. Thank you. So, as long as they're done by 11.59, 59 p.m., you're good. So, Going with the three-part uh, sort of formula, here's how it works. Step one, you would present and hopefully argue for the right. 
For example, you might uh, have a right to privacy. You might take that as a right, or a right to religious freedom, or a right to free expression, or a right to life, or a right to death, or a right to self-abuse, or a right to freedom of speech. And pretty much, you can claim just about anything. Of course, you want to make it relevant to what you're talking about. Secondly, you'd apply the right to whatever it is you're discussing. So, for example, if you're talking about a case of um, the government not getting into like your phone calls, your email, you might appeal to a right to privacy. Or if you're arguing, say, against capital punishment, you might argue for a right to life. Then you take the right, apply it to whatever you're applying it to, and then you would draw the appropriate conclusion that this is something that would be acceptable or good or unacceptable or bad. Now, that of course is pretty generic. You know, <laughs> present the right, hopefully argue for it, apply it to the thing, draw the appropriate conclusion. So it would be some more concrete examples of how you could work this in a paper. Well, let's take um, a couple examples. One could be, one that's kind of popular these days is say government, you know, spying. And we can take a particular particular case. For example, tracking your phone calls. And if you're familiar with like what the government's up to, they had a program that tracked all phone calls. What they claim is is that they didn't actually have the content of the phone calls. So they don't have like a recording of what you, you know, said. What they have is the number you called, uh, your number, the number you called, and how long. And of course that provides a lot of information. You know, a person with some reasonably good inductive skills could work out quite a bit just from those that limited information. Now, suppose you want to argue that that's wrong. Government shouldn't be doing that. One thing you could do is argue for a right to privacy. And the challenge there would be trying to give a reasons why people have a right to privacy. Now, one way to do this, you know, kind of a you know, straightforward way, is to use applying moral theory, we saw earlier, and you could use, for example, um, legalism. You know, as we saw, legalism the view that whatever the law says is right, whatever the law says is legal is wrong. And what you could do is you can make an appeal as people have done, that they claim that the Constitution provides a right to privacy. Some will say that it doesn't. We can make that argument. Say, well, the Constitution specifies you know, a particular amendment, which entails a right to you know, privacy. You know, it says, you know, secure your papers, et cetera, et cetera. And that could be interpreted as including you know, your phone calls. And then you say under legalism, whatever is legal, you know, set by the highest law, is morally correct. The Constitution gives us a right to privacy. Therefore, the government intruding into our, you know, our private papers, in this case our phones, would be a violation of their right. Therefore, that is morally wrong. Now, what would be another way to make the, the argument? Well, if you don't use applying moral theory, you could find some other arguments for rights. For example, one way to do this is to, well, you could go in, instead of doing like you know, legalism stuff, you could appeal to established views. For example, John Locke, as we'll see in part three, lays out you know, arguments for the right to life, liberty, and property. And so you could find arguments presented by other people. So you could say, I'll argue, I accept the right to privacy. The argument for this is, you, know, you could do an appeal to authority. You know, here's the argument given by Locke or someone else. The government getting into our you know, phone records would violate that right to privacy, therefore it's wrong. Another example, you take, um, oh. take an unusual right. A right to self-abuse. Now we don't find that listed in the you know Declaration of Independence or any of the you know Bill of Rights, but 
you could argue that people have a right to basically do stuff to themselves that harms themselves, but doesn't harm others. This would include, I mean, it could include such things, obvious things like suicide, self-mutilation, which some people do, but it can include other things like the use of um, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, etc. Because those things are harmful. I mean, they call it intoxication because it is toxic. It is, you know, harmful. So you could argue for there being a right of self-abuse. How could you do that? Well, one way to do it is to, again, you can make use of pre-existing theories. When you get to part four, we see our good dead friend John Stuart Mill. In his essay on liberty, he argued that people have a right to be free of the control of others to the degree that they're not affecting others. So Mill basically argues, if what I'm doing is not harming someone else, what I do is no business of theirs. It's only my business. What if it's harmful to myself? Well, that could be a stupid thing to do, and I'm wise, but no one has a right to stop me if it's not hurting them. Therefore, you could say we have a right of self-abuse, not to harm others, but to harm ourselves. And you could take, uh, if you want to argue that drug use should be more acceptable, you could say, well, if you have a right to self-abuse, yeah, most of the drugs will mess people up. You take things, you know, alcohol is harmful, tobacco is harmful, uh, Twinkies are harmful. Harder drugs like heroin, uh, was it Flaca? Is that the new, the new cool drug? Uh, all these things are, you know, potentially harmful. But you could argue that, well, if it's not hurting other people, the person has a right to do that. So if someone wants to use heroin in the privacy of their own home, then you can include, given the right of self-abuse, they have a right to do so. You know, provided, again, they're not harming other people. So if it was a drug that made people, like, insane and violent, apparently that's what, you know, things like Flacca does, then you can make an argument against it, because if it makes someone, like, insane and violent, yeah, that brings in others, so people would have a right against that. But if someone just wants to get really high and sit in their basement and play Xbox games, then the right of self-abuse would seem to allow that. And of course, we can make almost any right. For example, we could have the right to uh, freedom of religion. And you could argue, you know, if you want to do cases, you know, torn from today's headlines, you could take, for example, the same-sex marriage debate. There was um, various cases, like in the private sector. There was the people who owned a pizza place, and uh, same-sex couple wanted them to cater the wedding and they refused to do so on the grounds that it was against their religious beliefs. And they claimed a right of freedom of religion, so therefore their refusal would be morally acceptable. Similarly, um, there was a baker who made the same, same argument, that baking a cake for a same-sex wedding would violate his, his right of freedom of religion, so he should have the right to refuse. And most recently, of course, Kim Davis takes her view is that same-sex marriage is wrong given her religion, Therefore, she has, because of her right of freedom of religion, she has the right to refuse to provide marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Now, of course, as always, a challenge would be to argue for this right of religion. One way to do it, again, is since it's a right you know, legal in the United States, you could use legalism. It's a law. Legalism says that what is legal is right. Therefore, it's right. Or you can use some other argument. You could argue perhaps on consequentialist grounds, that you know, people have this freedom because it has good consequences. Or you can provide other reasons. I mean, this, this, as you might imagine, there's lots of arguments for the freedom of religion. People have invented the wheel here, and you can avail yourself of those. And then you apply them and draw the appropriate conclusion. So if you're working on something that involves you know, rights, and there are many things, this would be a good way to argue. It's kind of my second go-to method. If I get tired of you know, cranking through appeal to consequences, I'll break out an appeal to rights, especially if it's something involving like religion or expression or life or death, because those things are easily characterized as arguments about rights. So there's a formula. Basically, give the relevant right, give some reasons as to why it should be accepted, apply it to the thing, draw the appropriate conclusion. Now you can also use this, um, the ones in the examples we've looked at so far, involve basically saying that something is right. 
Now you can also do it, use it to show that something is wrong. For example, you could have like a right of uh, free expression, you know, freedom to express yourself, and you could argue that something would violate the freedom of expression, therefore it would be wrong. So you can use it to argue either that something should be allowed or should be prevented. You can also argue that not only something should be allowed or prevented, you can also use it to argue that things should be provided. For example, and I'll use this as a last example. One, um, one in interesting debate is whether or not citizens have a right to health care from their government. And some people think yes, and if we have a right to health care, then this would entail that being provided with health care would be, you know, obviously morally good. Now, of course, the challenge would be trying to find a way to argue why we have such a right. One option would be to do this. Um, if you're interested in this, this debate, here's why you could argue. You could argue that it's intuitively the function of the state, at the very least, is to protect citizens from harm. So pretty much everyone who agrees that there should be states agrees that states need to provide you know, police, defense, uh, you know, enforcement of laws, protecting citizens from enemies foreign and domestic. So what you could argue is, is that if the state is obligated to protect the lives of citizens, it shouldn't matter whether the threat is al-Qaeda or asthma. It shouldn't matter whether it's terrorist or tuberculosis. It shouldn't matter whether it's diabetes or some bad thing that begins with D. Uh, dire wolves will go with that. So you could argue if that's the case, if the citizens have a right to be defended by the state, and these diseases are threats to the well-being of the citizens, they have a right to health care. Therefore, the provision of health care would be morally not only correct, but morally obligatory. Just as the state has to provide police and military, has to provide health care. As long as we go to the right side, mm -hmm. Yeah, you are. Oh, it doesn't have to be they, because one one way, one way to, to show that there's a right is you could you can make an appeal to a moral theory, uh, legalism, and say the right the right is set legally. We have a legal right to it. Therefore, through legalism, legalism is a theory that what is legal is therefore morally right. So that'd be one way to one way to argue that the right does exist. Oh yeah, well, in terms of the breakdown, the first step is you try to show that there's a right to whatever it is you want a right to. It could be like health care, free of expression, a right to keep and bear arms, a right to free assembly, a right to free of religion. And then what you do is you try to give some reason why the reader should accept there is such a right. And one way to do that is to use one option is to use legalism. Legalism is a moral theory that whatever is legal is morally correct because it's the law. And whatever is legal is wrong because it's against the law. So you, you could say, well, under assuming legalism, this moral theory, since there is the you know, legal right to freedom of expression, given legalism, what is legally legal is morally good, therefore there is a moral right to free expression. And you could say that this, you know, a person expressing themselves through their art, for example, is free expression, therefore that would be morally acceptable. Yeah, I'm trying to connect the first one to the second one. So if we have the right to walk on the street, mm -hmm. on the sidewalk, how do you connect the second one? What is the second one supposed to be? Oh, the second would be the particular situation. This would be like a general right like a right to free expression or a right to say walk on the street. You could say something else. If citizens have a right to walk on the street, you could say therefore they have the right to walk on this street. Or like a, another example would be if people have a right to freedom of religion, generally, you could say that a person would have the right to refuse on religious grounds to bake a cake for a same-sex couple because they could already contend it violates their right of freedom of religion. Uh -oh. 
Yeah, so you come up with a right that says, my right, I have a general right to this. Therefore, in this particular case, I, it applies in this case. Like, again, yeah, like another example would be like, um, if you write a freedom of expression, you could say, therefore, I have a right to protest. So my protesting something would be morally acceptable. Because? Oh, the right, though. Right. Yeah, right of free expression. Which goes with the appeal to right. Yes, because this is the appeal. Oh, this is the, a, the appeal to right. Example of appeal to right. Oh, it's a form of it. To, to make an appeal to rights, you would you, uh, you give the right appeal to it and then draw the appropriate conclusion. Like some might say, I have a right to privacy. The government getting into my phone records violates my right to privacy. Therefore, the government getting my phone records is morally wrong. Or a person might say, I have a right to death. <laughs> Therefore, you know, deciding when I'm going to die is granted by my right to death. Therefore, if I choose to commit suicide, I have that moral, it's morally acceptable for me to do that. Or as another example, a person might say, uh, the state has a, oh, I have a right to being protected by the state. You know, the state you know, is supposed to exist to protect, provide defense, you know, police, military, etc. Uh, since I have this right, uh, there are threats posed by diseases and illness. Therefore, I have a right to health care from the state. Therefore, I have that moral, you know, morally, the state should provide me with health care. So to state a right is moral? I mean, well, it could be. I mean, there are legal rights, you know, people, but we're looking at the, the moral rights. So typically the pattern would be is you'd, you'd establish, try to show there's a right of something or to something or against something, and then you'd apply that right to the situation you're, you're dealing with, and then you draw the appropriate conclusion. So for example, if, if you have a right to keep and bear arms that shall not be infringed, and you argue that's a moral right, and you show that a particular, say, let's take a, we'll take an example torn from today's headlines. Let's take the issue of whether people with concealed weapon permits should be allowed to bring their guns on campus. This is going up for the legislature again. There's also uh, another bill that's proposing that people be allowed to uh, open carry, which basically means you just you have a gun to walk around with a gun. For real. I mean, you got to have a, you know, concealed weapons, you got to have a permit to, to do that, but you walk around with, with, with guns. They do in Texas, in most other states. Yeah, most, most states do have, have open carry. Now, suppose you take the, the right of keeping bare arms, and you argue that's a moral right. You have a moral, not just a legal right, but a moral right to be armed. You could say, well, if I have a moral right to be armed to protect myself, then I would have, it would seem that if we take the case of carrying you know, guns on campus, then it would follow, given my right to keep bare arms, applying the situation of guns, concealed weapons on campus, it would be morally acceptable for me to be able to do that. So the state would be wrong to deny me that basic right. And that'd be an argument for allowing concealed carry on campus. That might write. That's the right that is legally found. Well, you'd want to argue that. Well, you want to argue that there is such a right, such a moral right. I mean, this legal argumentation about rights, and that that's something you know that you do like in a. Law, law class. Our concern is with the moral rights, but you can go from there is a legal right to that somehow grounds a moral right. Can you, can you distinguish the difference, like give an example of a legal right oh, and then legal. a moral right? Because I know you just explained them all, but to me it sounds like mm -hmm. the same thing with you. Like oh, they are. Time. I mean, in many cases, I mean, one thing that makes it kind of smushy is that people typically just. They they make no distinction. You know, people talk about their you know people argue about their rights. Unless someone's like a lawyer or a philosopher, they usually don't say by this I mean moral right or this I mean legal right. So one reason there's confusion is because when someone talks about their right to religious liberty, they probably mean both legal right, you know, First Amendment, and they probably also mean like a moral right as well. But the difference is this: a legal right is that's easiest to find. It is what is ever specified in the established 
law of the land. In other words, basically what's ever codified in what's regarded as a legitimate authority for that area, that would be the legal right. And those are the ones just like the Bill of Rights. It's whatever is enumerator, enumerated by the dominant legal system, the legitimate legal system. Moral rights could, you know, they could be similar, but the moral rights don't require like legal, legal ratification. They're accepted as being grounded in not just, you know, written down on, on paper as matters of law, but existing perhaps separate from law. And there's a lot of, one thing that also makes it confusing is there's a lot of debate about whether there are moral rights that actually exist separately. So now I understand what you're saying. So can you give an example of a moral right and tell me like how people could see it as in the law? Like elaborate. Oh, yeah, like for a moral right would be something like, well, actually they could be both. For example, we could take the freedom of expression as a moral right. That you could, you could argue that it doesn't matter what the law is in a, in a country, you have a, an independent right morally to speak. And so if a country like, say like China or Syria or Australia or the United States passed a law restricting that, now it would be you would not have the legal right. Suppose they get rid of the First Amendment. They decide, like, they could try to order the 14th Amendment. They say, no more First Amendment. People are talking too damn much. Get that up. Now, if that happened, you would no longer have the legal right to free expression because it would be cut out of the law. But it could be argued you could still have the moral right because the moral right, in general, doesn't depend on the law. So legal rights would be whatever the existing law where you happen to be says. And a good example is, you know, the Bill of Rights. That's a list of legal rights everyone, as he, every U.S. citizen gets. And those are legal rights. We also often see them as moral rights, because we think of them as being not just, we don't have them just because people wrote them down on paper. The claim is that we have enable rights endowed to us by our creator to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And those are presented as moral rights. The claim there is you don't get them because some dude sat down and wrote out some papers. You get them from just from existing, you know, the, the you know, doubt by the creator type of deal. Um, yeah. So in the paper, how would you object? You know how you say that's objective? Oh, yeah, good question. I haven't gotten to that yeah. yet. But did, I, did that help at all? Because legal, legal rights are whatever legal system you're under. You know, basically whoever's got the guns pointing at you and has written the rules out, those are your legal rights in that situation. So in the United States, it's what's ever in the Constitution, What's ever in the state laws, whatever is in the federal laws, those specify your legal rights. If you go to like China, your rights there are specified by Chinese law. So wherever you, whatever legal system you have to be under, whoever's got the guns, they decide <laughs> the laws. The moral rights, though, are, are typically taken as being separate from the law. Not always, depending on your moral views, but there's something separate. That it's something that doesn't depend on people just writing stuff down. They somehow some people claim exist independently. And we'll see when we get to part uh, three, talking about rights, we'll see more about the theory behind that. But the, the main difference would be practical with this. A legal right is such that you get it under the legal system you happen to be under, and if someone breaks that, they're breaking the law. They're acting illegally, and you can go to court and sue. A moral right is grounded by something else. Maybe God, maybe nature, wherever those come from. And there's something that would not depend on the law. So you couldn't sue someone for violating like a moral right in a legal system unless it was also a legal right. So that's the main difference, in a way. Okay. Um, is, um, <laughs> I know, right? I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, the straightforward yeah. difference is legal right is It'd be illegal for someone to, to violate that right, and you could and you could bring a lawsuit against someone for for go, for breaking that. But not moral. Yeah. But with moral one, the claim is that it'd be it'd be wrong to break that right, but it wouldn't be part of, automatically part of the legal system. Yeah. Moral rights can also be legal rights and vice versa. Okay. For example, we think we have most of us think we have a, a legal right to freedom of expression because you know First Amendment. But we also think that even if the government said, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna you know, repeal that. We would tend to think we still have a right to free expression, even though it's not no longer legal. Okay. Yeah, but the distinction between like the legal stuff and moral stuff is actually pretty complicated. Um, 
because you know, there's theories about, you know, is there just law, is there morality, what's the relation between the two? But the, but the way to handle sort of a practical thing is just, you know, stick with a moral right. You know, to say, you know, morally, <laughs> we have this right and this is why we're wrong to, to break it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In terms of responding, basically, here's the, the way to respond. So, suppose you're you do like you you want to write about something torn from today's headlines, and suppose you're doing the thing. We'll use the example of concealed carry on campus, and suppose someone wants to make a moral argument as opposed to legal argument. Well, like people would say, well, we well, have a right of self defense, a moral right as opposed to just a legal right, and you could argue that well, this would grant us morally the right to carry guns, weapons at all times. Because you know you might need to protect yourself at any point. So people should be morally allowed to carry guns on campus. Now the way to respond, a couple ways to respond. One is, is to criticize the right, to try to show that there is no such right. For example, a person might argue that there is no right of self-defense, which would be a tough thing to argue, but could be argued. A better, a better example that people could argue about would, might be, um, say, your right to privacy. Okay, can I, you were saying it wasn't a good example for self-defense. Is it like um, self-defense when you kill someone and it's a moral wrong when you kill someone and it's against the law when you kill someone? Is that a good example or no? Well, I mean, you could argue a particular case, like killing someone could always be, you could argue, yeah. I mean, one thing is you, you have no right to self-defense because it's always wrong to kill yeah. people. Yeah, that could be one way to, to argue. You could argue there is no right to self-defense. And so a pacifist, yeah, good, good point. Pacifists can argue that. You can never kill anybody for any reason, so there would be no rights to self-defense. Mm -hmm. So people would not have a right to carry guns on campus because they have no right to self-defense. Yes. Yeah, that would be one way to, to do it, to argue there is no, no such right. Another way to do it is to accept there is a right, but you could argue that the, the right is being somehow misinterpreted. For example, take the right of freedom of religion. One um, important part of the debate is whether or not the right of freedom of religion allows you to basically, I don't want to say inflict, but allows you to sort of impose your moral views on others. So, for example, a person might say, well, freedom of religion means you can practice religion as you want. You can't be compelled to practice a religion or, or you know, not practice a religion, but it doesn't allow you to make others live by your views. So, someone might say that, if suppose, suppose I'm a, a Jainist, and I don't believe anything should be killed, no living creature should be killed, and I'm working as a uh, in the licensing division, you know, selling, you know, providing hunting and fishing licenses, and my religious view is nothing should be killed, does my freedom of religion, does that allow me to refuse you the right to hunt or fish because I am opposed to it? And one way to argue would be, well, no. I, my freedom of religion means I do not have to be forced to hunt or fish or kill things, but I can't, I have no right to force other people to live by my moral, my, by my religious views. So you can argue that the, the right is being mis misinterpreted. Another option is you could accept the right, but contend it doesn't really apply, it's not being applied correctly in that case. For example, going with the right of self-defense, we could say, yes, people do have a right of self-defense. But one person could argue that it wouldn't apply to carrying concealed weapons on campus. Because one thing you could argue is that the potential for, or one way to do it is like an appeal to you know, consequences because of the dangers. Or you could say that the right doesn't really work in this particular case. So main options are one is you could say there is no such right. Option two is the right is being you know, misinterpreted. Option three is to argue the right is being misapplied in that particular case. Another option is to use another method to try to counter it. For example, going with the example of the you know, concealed carry on campus, we could agree that people do have a right of self-defense. And we could, we could even agree that it's being applied correctly. That the right of self-defense gives people the right to carry concealed weapons on campus. 
But we could argue that there is a compelling reason to override that right. I mean, to use the usual example, we agree that people have a right to freedom of expression. We agree that people have a right to express themselves and say that, you know, present their views. But we think there are limits. That the freedom of expression does not give people the right to scream fire in a crowded theater, you know, when there's no fire, because of all the, you know, trouble that would happen. And so it might extend that people have a right to self-defense. This gives them the right to conceal carry weapons. But you could argue that this shouldn't be allowed on campus because of the potential for harm. For example, um, there are some high schools allow teachers to carry guns. And recently, a teacher shot himself in the foot with a gun. And so one concern might be, imagine if your professor's got a gun, and they're not well trained with the gun. Because all you have to do to get concealed weapon permits, you go through a class, four hours, you fire maybe 10 shots with a 22 pistol, and boom, you're good to carry a concealed weapon permit. I know that because I went through the class myself. And so you could have somebody who's fired 10 shots carrying a gun in a crowded classroom, maybe in their backpack. Everyone's seen professors drop stuff, right? We drop stuff all the time because we are clumsy. <laughs> and so imagine like someone drops their backpack, boom, you know, you get a, get a 45 round on your shoulder, like, ah, <laughs> that, that kind of stung. <laughs> and so there's a concern that, you know, people would be, you know, there'd be guns going off in classrooms, people would be armed. And so you could argue by the pill of consequences that it would be, you know, potentially very dangerous, leading to trouble. And so you could use an appeal to consequences to counter the appeal to rights. Um, another example, take the right of self-abuse, that people should be allowed to use, like, heroin, um, all the drugs they want. Now, one way to argue against that would be to appeal to consequences, that allowing that would result in all kinds of potential harms. If people would be, um, if some people are using heroin, you could argue, well, they'd become a danger to others, they'd be, they might turn to crime, which often occurs to get their heroin, maybe have medical expenses, and so we could say even though people have that right, the consequences of making that legal would over, override that, that right. So in other words, you could say it's too harmful to let people exercise that right. So that'd be one, another way to do it. So in terms of building it, the idea is present the right, and there's all kinds of right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, keep and bear arms, free expression, self-abuse, uh, freedom of religion, etc. Apply it to the particular situation that you're concerned with and draw the appropriate conclusion. And a good, you know, good current example if you're looking for a topic could be religious liberty. What does that justify and allow people to say not provide services to same-sex couples? Would it allow government officials not provide marriage licenses? Another example from today's headlines would be right of privacy. What, does this make it morally wrong for the government to get our phone records, etc.? You can also have the right of, um, again, self-defense, keeping bare arms. Would this morally justify people being allowed to carry concealed weapons on campus? And would it morally justify, say, open carry? Or how about open carry on campus? People just walking around carrying, you know, assault rifles you know, to class and stuff. And in terms of countering it, the options are, one, try to argue there is no such right. Two, try to sort of redefine the right. Three, argue that it's being misapplied in that case. And fourth, using some other method to try to counter the right. Before I go into our last method, in our remaining 11 minutes, anything about rights that needs more rights or lifts? I don't want to discriminate. Our last method is mixing norms, and we've actually seen this, um, you know, in various examples. And of course, as usual, I have my no expenses spared, high quality Microsoft clip art example. Now, mixing norms works like this. The idea is that we often want to go from one normative area to another, like you were asking, you know, law and morality, you know, what's the connection what's, and what's the difference? Or religion and law, or religion and morality. And people often want to go from one normative area, 
religion, law, ethics, to another one. So people often want to say something is forbidden by religion, so it should be illegal. Something is immoral, it should be illegal. Something is against the religion, so it should be immoral. Something is illegal, so it should be immoral. And people are always wanting to do that type of stuff. Now, there are two ways to do this. One way is the bad way, and the other way is the reasonable way. Now, the, the flawed way, which is one you shouldn't use, is when someone just does this. Step one, they show that something, let's call it X, has a particular status in a, in a normative area. We'll call it M1. So the idea is that something, let's say, um, um, same-sex marriage has the status of being a sin in a person's religion, for example. Or capital punishment <coughs> is legal in a particular state. Or killing people is immoral on this particular moral view. You know, whatever you're talking about. Now, the bad method, that's say the one that doesn't work logically, is just to go from this is a status in you know, one area, and then say that X has you know, a comparable status in another area. To give a concrete example, if someone says same-sex marriage is a sin in my religion, therefore same-sex marriage is immoral, or same-sex marriage is a sin in my religion, therefore same-sex marriage should be illegal. And people, you know, do that automatically. They just say that kind of stuff. But of course, it doesn't fall. Just because something is a sin, if some in a religion, doesn't mean it should be illegal. Likewise, just because something's legal doesn't mean it's moral. There are many things that have been legal that are morally horrifying. And likewise, just because something's immoral doesn't mean that it should automatically be illegal. There are many things morally wrong that we wouldn't take to be automatically being illegal. So what we need is step two, the transition. We need something that allows us to go from, say, religion to law, or religion to ethics, or ethics to law, or law to ethics. So how can we make that transition? Well, one way, a super easy way to do it is if we want to go from law to ethics, we've seen our good friend legalism. Legalism is a moral theory that makes this happen. It, legalism is a view that whatever is legal is good because it's legal. Whatever is illegal is bad because it's illegal. So an easy way to make the transition is to say, well, same-sex marriage is legal in the United States. By legalism, what is legal is ethical. Therefore, same-sex marriage is ethical. Now, another common way to do it is if you, if you want to go from religion to ethics, there's our good friend, Divine Command Theory, or for short, DCT. Divine Command Theory, as we'll see in more detail in part two, is the view that whatever God commands is good, because he commands it, and whatever he forbids is evil, because he forbids it. So here's an easy argument against same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage has, is a sin in religion forbidden in Leviticus, at least in Christianity, you know, abomination, just like shellfish. Divine command theory says whatever is in the religion, if, you know, forbidden by God, is in the ethics that is same morally wrong. Therefore, since you know, same-sex marriage is regarded as abomination, a sin in religion, therefore it's morally wrong. Now, suppose you want to get from religion to law. There's also a theory for that as well. In, um, in Islam, it's called Sharia law. But there is a well-established you know, moral theory, a legal theory for that. There is a view that whatever is in the religion should be the law. Um, interestingly enough, um, ISIS <laughs> believes it. Uh, Sarah Palin, the noted you know, political philosopher, has argued for it as well. And what you can argue is 
using the idea that the law of God should be the law of man, you go from religion to law. This is in the religion going by the, the theory that what is the law of God, God should be the law of man, and therefore, or people, not to be sexist, therefore this should be legal or illegal. And there are other theories that let you tra transition you know, back and forth. So what we need to do is by applying a moral theory, and there are moral theories explicitly built for transition. They're kind of all the way like mathematical operations that let you get from one thing to another. Or like transformers, they turn something from a, a truck into a giant robot, and back again. Although Transformers is much cooler than, <laughs> than this. Oh, this is, a, this is a better plot. Now, what's another way to do it? Suppose you don't have a theory that can make the transition, or you don't want to use it. One other option is just to argue. Make an argument for the transition. For example, Suppose you're going to argue that what's in religion should be the law, or should be, you know, set in morality. Well, you could argue like this. Um, God is all-knowing, all-good, and all-powerful. Therefore, he knows, what is, he knows what is good. Being good, he always commands what is good. Therefore, whatever God lays out in religion should be what is morally good. Because being all-good, God will always command the good. Being all-knowing, he can't be wrong. So whatever God says is good has got to be good. He can't be mistaken about this. Which would be a little different than divine command theory. Divine command theory is God says it's good, so it's good. And this other argument would be, well, God knows what is good. And he tells us what is good because he's good. If you want to go from ethics to the law, you could argue that the state has an obligation to protect, the, protect its citizens from harm. And moral things are harmful. Therefore, given the state has the, right, has the obligation to protect people from harm, and immoral things are harmful, whatever is morally wrong should also be illegal. And so there's various ways to do that. Now, in terms of where you might use this, here are some examples I've given before. Example one. Suppose you want to do the uh, case on cheating in a relationship, like adultery. Well, the super easy way is uh, adultery is a sin in religion. Divine command theory, boom. <laughs> adultery is immoral. Suppose you want to argue that eating lobster is immoral. Uh, Leviticus, shellfish is an abomination. Boom. Divine command theory, lobster is immoral. Done. Or suppose you want to you know, go and appeal to rights. Suppose you want to argue for rights. Well. You can show that uh, you have a legal right to free expression, legalism, boom. You have a moral right to free expression, done. So mixing norms is pretty useful. We need to get one area to another. It does it, does what needs to be done. So to close in our remaining two minutes, how do you counter this? Well, counter one is this. You could argue something does not have that status. For example. We'll go with my lobster argument. <clears throat> Leviticus, shellfish is an abomination. Divine command theory, whatever is written by God is wrong, therefore lobster is wrong. One way to argue against this is to say, well, if you look at the New Testament, there's, at least according to some scholars and some religions, all that was considered unclean before has been rescinded. Basically, the dietary laws of the Old Testament have been rescinded. So lobster are no longer you know, New Testament lobs are no longer unclean, so that would change it. You know, divine command theory still works, lobster is now okay. Divine command theory, lobster is morally acceptable. Key. So, mixing norms, you're just making an inference, basically? Yeah, you're saying, you know, this is like, this is a sin of religion, transition, so it's morally wrong. Or, this is illegal in law, transition, so it should be immoral. Or, whatever transition you need to to make. Thank you. You're welcome. Second thing you can do is attack the transition. So if someone's doing the lobster argument, you know, lobster is abomination, divine command theory, if lobster is morally wrong, a person could go after divine command theory, and there's lots of stark arguments against that. Or the person argues in the transition, you can go after the argument. Because if you can break the transition, it's kind of like cutting the, you know, to use an analogy, it's like old, you know, phone lines were actual lines. You cut the line, you cut the, the transfer. 
And so that's basically the two main ways. Either attack the thing or attack the transition. Breaking either one breaks the mixing. Okay, so I see by um, the time we're done. So next week, be sure to finish uh, the quizzes for part one by 11th and 9th tonight. And on Monday, we'll pick up with part two, Adventures in Moral Theory.